Oh, good day. Um, my name's Dave Riley, uh, 2012 scholar, and my uh, my subject is managing dates for premium fruit production. Actually, I think I'll stand here, a bit more comfortable. Uh, and um, thanks very much to Woolworths, um, who have sponsored me for my Nuffield scholarship, but also prior to that through the Sustainable Farming Grants in 2009. So Woolworths have been fantastic, and needless to say, uh, Nuffield Australia, uh, not just for the one full 12 months, but even the last little bit of polish that Liz has tried to, to put on this presentation and on myself, so hopefully I can do that justice. A um, little bit about our story and our background. Um, I'm a horticulturalist from the Riverland of South Australia, my closest town being Berry, in between Berry, Loxton and Renmark. Um, I have a fantastic family, uh, my wife Anita, she's um, a very much a strong, strong part of the business. Unfortunately can't be with us today, but uh, just sent me through a text, good luck, so I hope you do it proud. I've got four kids that have just been fantastic as well. The oldest lad, 20. Um, Sean's 20. He's looking to uh, come back to the business, so uh, we're trying to get it right. So about three hours' drive from Adelaide, we're on the Murray River. Actually, not quite the Murray River. We irrigate from the Gurra Gurra wetlands, which is a backwater of the Murray River. So we do have some challenges with water flow, but we're first-generation farmers, and we started with uh, growing vegetables, overhead sprinklers, and then we moved to wine grapes. But some of our biggest challenges have come through water quality. And we irrigate from the Gurra Gurra wetlands, which is the third largest wetland in the Riverland, but it's largely unmanaged. And the first, uh, first time we uh, saw the place, we fell in love with it and we set it up. 1989 to 1993, seven floods in five years. You know, what could go wrong? Well, what went wrong is we didn't get another flood for 17 years. And that, uh, that meant enormous challenges with our water quality. In fact, we got up to 5,500 DC units and we needed to make a decision. There, there we were, um, a marriage, mortgage, four kids, and uh, you know, it was uh, time to either roll the swag and move on or, or to start thinking um, a little differently. So we, uh, we started to research salt-tolerant crops, knowing that that's the environment and the resources that we had to work with. We kept coming back to date palms. But surprisingly to us, at that time, which is now 1996, even though there was amazing amounts of date palms on old stations and out bush and surrounding old mound springs all over the country, there was no plant material available for sale in Australia that was both plant, uh, pest and disease-free of known superior genetics. So that was a major obstacle. And the limitation also was that there was no grower knowledge. You know, even still today, there's less than 50 hectares of date production in Australia. Compare this to 800,000 hectares in the Northern Hemisphere. 40 countries with 7 million metric tonnes of fruit produced in the Northern Hemisphere. Even in today in Australia, it's still <coughs> barely 20 tonne annually. So we're right at the very start. Um, of a new industry. So the knowledge gaps, that's what, they're the challenges. Um, it's been a few year, years building up to it, but in 2001, Anita and myself um, had some success in importing the first genetics into the country. Uh, it took a while building up the infrastructure at home to accommodate that, and it's a long story which I'll just summarise today. That it's been a challenge, but I'm very proud to, um, to inform you that, that today we have 25 varieties of some of the world's best genetics originating from countries like Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Morocco and North Africa. So moving on through this time that's, um, that's um, taken us, uh, I guess, one season at a time, we've had fantastic support from Rural Industry Research and Development Corporation that have identified that there could be some positive industry spin-offs for what we're trying to do with our family farming business. So we've really tried to set up Gara Downs Date Company, which is the name of our home business, as a research and development field trial site, where we economically and climatically evaluate these varieties which we've imported. And moving on through the years, just recently uh, we're starting to, to reach the exciting stage now where we're actually achieving commercial fruit production. Uh, when I say commercial, it's still very, very, very small, but we now know that there is a couple of varieties in particular that we can go ahead in, uh, into mainstream production while we're still waiting for younger varieties to come on and prove themselves. 
However, as I'm walking up and down these rows and understanding the limitation uh, in knowledge available in Australia, I can't help thinking that there must be better ways, or there, well, what is the best way to irrigate? You know, what, is, what is the maximum amount of water I should be thinking to apply on these date pumps? You know, what should be the fertiliser regimes that we target? How, how's the best way to prune these things? How do we pollinate them? What's the best way of pollinating these reducing labour? <coughs> there must be some shortcuts when we come to harvesting fruit. What are they? I mean, we're reading about these things in textbooks, but there must be better ways to learn. What machineries are there to mechanise some of the operations? What should we do with the amazing amount of biomass that we prune off a tree each year? You know, we're getting up to 100 kilos of leaf prunings per year off one tree. What are some of the uses that we can put to work with this, with this biomass? I'm thinking we better quick get our eye in with some of the pest and disease problems that might appear in our, in our industry. And also the date palm, because we're planting nine to 10 metres apart, lends itself to intercropping between those rows. So what are some of the examples? Well, all of these things are going through our mind and we really got very limited learning in Australia. And that's why I was just so thrilled to, to apply with the uh, encouragement of another South Australian Nuffield scholar who encouraged us to apply uh, under the Nuffield system. Um, and again, thank you for Woolworths because the, the, the learning over the last few months has just been profound. It's allowed us to set off. And when I say us, I'm talking about my wife and my younger son, Jonty, accompanied me through the USA and Mexico. <coughs> they returned home after three and a half weeks and then I set sail for, or flew I should say, to France, um, UK, Spain, Egypt, Kuwait, Oman, India and the United Arab Emirates. The USA was um, a huge learning curve for us because these guys are export focused. They've been at it for a relatively short term, uh, a relatively short time, being only a century. But the USDA collection has got a wonderful repository there and we were able to walk through their repository looking at some varieties, not just looking, but also tasting fruit and sampling the fruit qualities of their wonderful, wonderful collection. We also um, had a wonderful experience with the Bard Valley uh, Medjool date growers who um, really just <coughs> almost took ownership of us and we, we were chaperoned from grower to grower and we weren't expecting that because the USA do export a lot of their fantastic medial dates into Australia and we're potentially competition. But that in mind, they weren't fearful in any way, shape or form of our uh, presence there and our, uh, our uh, I guess, eager um, um, appetite for learning. So we looked at very old plantations, how they're managing these big trees, we met with uh, younger plantations. This guy here had uh, 3,300 acres of uh, medjules, both young and old. And it really built us up with our confidence because we could see not only what they're achieving today, but their future expansion plans and the way they're going about um, a strategic approach in marketing their fruit. It uh, instilled a lot of confidence. We looked at some businesses that were um, both producing but also marketing in their own roadside sales, uh, bolstering, um, you know, restaurant duties, etc., to attract and entice customers, as well as looking at businesses that were just set up independently from date plantations, but were just sourcing product from a number of different growers and were, had a very strong tourist orientation. Uh, so yeah, we looked at quite a few um, date specialty marketing shops and it did give us some scope, I guess, at looking at that particular way of marketing fruit, as well as looking at a very interesting um, way of broadening the product base. But our main learning at this stage of the game is really got to be plantation based. And while we were there at home sawing off date palms with little saws and uh, chainsaws etc, you know, we saw the machine that these guys were using, uh, hydraulic snips to uh, quickly get through plantations. We saw machines that they were using to extract male pollen from flowers. Alternatively to that, we've been hanging up flowers in sheds, taking up enormous amounts of space and time, trying to get pollen to settle onto newspaper and raking it up and going and then applying it. These guys were extracting pollen and then they designed specialised pollen blowers for treating broadacre uh, plantations at flowering time uh, very quickly and efficiently. 
we've been grappling with how do we uh, find an efficient way of removing offshoots from the base of trees. Offshoots are genetically identical to the parent plant, so they are valued. We do need them for future expansion, but you do win a few blisters, and we were finding up to three or four hours of swinging a sledgehammer and a crowbar uh, and, a, and a chisel to get uh, you know, even one offshoot off. Um, they're important to us because uh, you know, we can get uh, fruit production from an offshoot in two to three years. But after we uh, saw these guys with a jackhammer power head and a harpoon chisel point mounted on a bobcat, we could understand now where we need to be thinking and the efficiencies we can gain. Uh, just get out of bed that uh, with a little bit more spring in the step in the morning when we get on a bobcat as, as opposed to a crowbar. One of the other main uh, difficulties that we haven't had to grapple with yet, but we know it is coming, is how do you get up these bloody things? And um, I guess it's not fair for uh, us uh, for, for us to um, expect an employee to put a rope around a trunk of a tree and shimmy up a date palm. It's probably not realistic in this country, although that is still probably the way that most of the 800,000 hectares are managed in the, in, in the old date growing world. The Americans have gone through a system of developing these hydraulic lifts and these platforms, which is taking them a long time and a legal team to get these through the occupational health and safety agencies to be approved. So now these work forms, they simply open at the front, open at the front, they drive these little frames into the trunk and then it's raised by either a forklift or an extension lift. And uh, it allows up to eight people to walk around a platform on a workstation with a harness that can be attached to the sidewalk. So it's uh, very safe and it brings a lot of efficiencies. The other, another area we've been grappling with is uh, when we do remove a, a front off a date palm, you know, it can be four, four and a half metres long, and the material uh, laying on the ground can lend itself to uh, tangling with other machinery. You know, uh, even uh, if it's still got thorns on it, you can still pierce, pierce tyres with it. So they're not easy to handle, and if we're going to load them up in a trailer and take them away and burn them, burn them you know, it's perhaps not a really smart way of dealing with it either. But these guys had... Um, uh, had, we're working with this threading type machine where they simply can lay the frond on the ground then straddle the windrow with a shredder and they sh can shred these otherwise pretty hard fibrous material into uh, wonderful organic mulch and that worked very well. That's where we need to be now. I mean there is a lot of other by products that can uh, be, be made from date palm prunings, uh, timber products and stock feeds. Um, there's a wonderful array of things that can be made with the stock feed, but we're not there yet. So this is a simple way of dealing with this quickly. In the States, we were there at fruit thinning time. Fruit thinning in the States is approximately one-third of their input costs. And bearing in mind that with their Mexican labour, they're on, um, on approximately $7 an hour labour. So we still don't know whether this will be the best way for us to go. There is other ways of thinning fruit. But the process of thinning fruit allows for larger fruit size to occur and it also allows for a very high pack out rate. These guys are achieving an 80% pack out rate into a premium grade product. So their uh, input costs into thinning fruit is paid back by a very high pack out rate. There again, I don't know whether we'll do that, but it's certainly a good way for us to, to be thinking. Across the border into Mexico, you know, I was blown away by what I saw there. Very, very professional plantations, very uniform um, production methods, and uh, they pretty much specialise in only one variety. So it may be that whilst we have 25 varieties now, we might find over a period of years we um, fine-tune ourselves into a, a lesser number of production um, methods being, being varieties. Mexicans also, we had the uh, chance to visit their packouts, pack houses and they, that gives us uh, a bit of a vision for the future and some of the needs for handling fruit. From, a met, uh, from uh, how's my time? Yep, I better keep moving here. Um, On to the UK and uh, I guess people may be surprised that the UK has any association with the date industry but we um, f have had a very long standing, in fact 12 years association with date palm developments who are uh, fantastic at breeding varieties that, um, that we need for Australia and they've been sending out varieties now uh, not just to ourselves but, but for other countries for 25 years. Uh, so at DPD in the UK we learnt about their tissue culturing facilities, 
we learnt about their nursery activities and that's very important for us because we are at this stage still Australia's only tissue culture date palm nursery and we're sending out plant material to other growers around Australia and some of the challenges and difficulties that they have in the UK, we share some of those challenges. So it was very good and uh, provided a shortcut for us to see some of the antidotes that they have to treat some of these challenges. After the UK, we elected to travel to, or I elected to travel to Spain, primarily because Spain at Elche is a region that's of less heat units than our own. So it was interesting for us just to take a, an inventory of what varieties they're succeeding with at those cooler heat regimes. Also, we discovered that they have major pest problems with the Indian red palm weevil, and it's alerted us, and, and it's actually it's inspired me to write to the Australian Quarantine Inspection Service and our local state authority just to make sure that they're up to date on this red palm weevil because it's, it's actually devastating their plantation. The Spanish have also affected ways of artificially ripening fruit, which uh, provides labour savings by the ability to harvest whole bunch harvest at close to harvest time, and then using temperature methods to artificially ripen the fruit. <coughs> On to Egypt. I really wanted to spend more time in Egypt, but it was um, right at the time. It was just slightly after the uprising, just a matter of a couple of days after the elections, and I think I was the only tourist in Cairo. So um, originally I was going to stay there a bit longer, but I actually cut that short. But in the time that we did have spending in at Cairo, I did actually get a chance to see some of the wonderful intercropping examples of this old world way of farming. After Egypt, I went on to Kuwait, purely and simply to catch up to Dr. Sudasan, who's one of the most creative minds I've ever met when it comes to plant breeding. This guy is actually breeding, um, crossing a hybrid wolf date palm with a Phoenix Dactylifera, or the true date palm. And that's uh, of enormous interest to us because the result of that is uh, breeding a date palm that won't, breed, uh, won't grow any taller than around about a metre and a half. That means we can access fruit from the ground, harvest fruit from the ground, and I think when you're competing against a dollar per hour on overseas markets, being able to march up and down your rows um, is um, you know, a great attribute. From Kuwait, I went on to Oman. We actually do stock in our inventory quite a number of the Omanian varieties, and Oman is very famous for bringing in some of the very, very first date varieties of the season, and there's amazing price bonuses for the first fruit that hits the market. We were um, very fortunate that the Department of Agriculture in Oman uh, took us under the wing and showed us all they had to show in terms of their tissue culture, uh, nursery and industry prospects and outlooks, as well as taking us to their repository where they have over 260 elite date palm varieties. So I had the chance to actually um, as like a kid in the candy shop, I had a, the um, ability to be able to look through these varieties and actually I've been in contact with these guys since and uh, I, I might be able to extract some more varieties from here to introduce into Australia. So there's a lot of uh, character differences between varieties. Uh, again in Oman we saw varieties, uh, we saw intercropping examples, in this case figs, grown between, beneath date palms. And also date palms are widely used as landscaping plants, in this case at a luxury hotel. On to India, and India is of interest to us because they are a new world date producing country, possibly got a decade head start on us. So I'm very interested to see how they, um, their strategic approach in adopting new technologies and um, I guess distributing the information and supplying support roles to other growers. So off to the Western Desert on the uh, border of uh, Pakistan where we got to meet with uh, other date growers and learn about their challenges and uh, look at the network services that they have as support and um, it was uh, of, of great interest. There again in, uh, in India we saw examples of intercropping, in this case pomegranates. So the, uh, the concept here is to get early, early <coughs> their returns with the pomegranates but also, uh, even those date palms, uh, one standing along with the white bags, they're already cropping. So there is some returns early, but the, uh, the pomegranates uh, speed up the process. To my amazement, um, after being flown down to, uh, to Mumbai with the Atoll Company, we saw date palms growing in a tropical environment. 
which um, totally blew me away because anyone who knows anything about date palms know you need to be in a semi-arid or arid environment. Uh, uh, I've changed my opinion of that because these guys were growing date palms and fruiting in the dry season and when the wet season broke, well then it was coconuts and mangoes. So that actually um, could revolutionise the way that dates are perceived in terms of their geographical footprint. After an amazing, amazing time in India, it was onto the United Arab Emirates, and we met up with uh, the uh, with uh, Tony Portman of uh, the Abu Dhabi Farm Services Centre. Tony being an ex-department of Ag guy uh, from Western Australia, um, him and his team are involved in managing millions of date palms on behalf of the sheikhs and other private growers, where they're assigned duties such as pest and disease management, um, irrigation innovation. Uh, harvesting techniques and they're actually even integrating marketing now so they're uh, marketing fruit not just out of the UAE but they're also picking up counter seasonal fruit from Namibia and they're sending that into high value markets into, into Europe but I learned a lot from these guys and uh, they're coming out with um, groundbreaking um, information on particular particularly irrigation water requirements which I'd like to think is um, an Australian born idea that's been integrated into uh, particularly Abu Dhabi where previous to Tony and Tony's uh, team's influence there wasn't uh, really much known um, about that program. At the Leeward Date Festival it coincided with the start of the harvest date and that's a, a pretty exciting time for the Emirates, the Emiratis, because uh, it gives them an opportunity to participate in the Leeward Date Festival and that means if you're lucky enough to win the heaviest bunch this year it was 110 kilos, you can drive away with a brand new four wheel drive. <laughs> Likewise, for all the different categories of fruit, whether it be Kalar, Kalas, Bahi, Medjul, Ambra, there's all these different varieties of fruit. And I had the very good fortune of sitting down with the judges and understanding what it is that makes a top quality fruit. But there again, the, the uh, participants of this competition, the winner of those classes, drive away with a brand new four wheel drive. So. It's uh, quite inspiring. Unfortunately, they don't take... Um, yeah, yeah, the Australian fruit can't get in there, unfortunately. Um, whilst in Dubai, I visited, to, visited the International Centre of Biosaline Centre, centre and um, they're basically um, targeting pastures using um, uh, saline water, but they have had a long-standing trial running with date palms. And at 5,000 EC units, 10,000, and 15,000 EC units, their trial, um, basically I can conclude from what they were doing there that it's okay to still grow date palms on 10,000 EC units, which um, where us at our highest was 5,500 EC, probably gives us a, a little bit of um, latitude to, to uh, hang in there and, uh, and keep progressing. But the other thing that this example does it show and, and clearly demonstrate is that there is actually amazing potential for wastewater reuse not just in irrigation, with irrigating, irrigation drainage water, but also right throughout the <coughs> industry. Being able to use water that's quite saline and, uh, and heavy in, in uh, boron, um, date palms is a, a very good and proven way of uh, getting a secondary crop. Back home, and uh, basically we're starting to implement some of these um, uh, new developments now in our own place. It'll still be quite a long time before we get to implementing all of them. But we still do get farmers turning up quite interested in what we're doing and we're happy to share that tale and I'd, I'd really like to, to um, you know, uh, thank the Nuffield team for allowing me to do that and, and certainly it's not just my own family that are benefiting from the sponsorship that Woolworths and Nuffield have, have, um, have, have um, endeared upon me but it's also these other growers now that uh, are coming looking for information we're able to share that with them. So my rec recommendations are simply <coughs> let's get as much mechanisation in the Australian date industry as possible Let's introduce these hydraulic lifts so we can adhere uh, with occupational health and safety standards. Let's um, implement this acquired knowledge and we'll distribute as much of this information both through the grower manual that I'm writing at the moment and, uh, and other information through the uh, Nuffield website and the Ridley website as we possibly can. In conclusion, it'd be remiss of me not to uh, reflect on the wonderful time that I had in the Global Focus Programme. And, uh, and these guys, I mean, I can see them all looking at this photo with smirks, and it's not, you know, with, with grins, because uh, we look at this photo and it just uh, a flood of memory comes back um, of where we were and what we did, and, uh, 
just those uh, those few weeks we had together where we could barely stop laughing. We had so much and we learned so much. And uh, so um, yeah, uh, thanks for the time we spent together, guys. That was just awesome. Is there anywhere where there's a concern about them becoming woody weeds? For that, yes, there is. In the right environment, the date palm does need ample water supply to grow. It is rare that they do get out of control, but I have seen them out of control at the Dalhousie Springs National Park, and in that case, uh, an unmanaged environment, unmanaged for more than 100 years. And in fact, um, on some of those mound springs, the encroachment of the dates have been to such a point that you can no longer visually see the water, and uh, that's actually um, taken away the, the ability for Indigenous landowners there to still uh, have their sacred um, sites open to them. So they've actually been up there um, chopping down trees and trying to clear that out. But um, that's only here in Australia. In some countries it's actually um, an offence to kill a date palm, greeted with a death penalty. So I'll just uh, put that there in the uh, background and I would like to talk to our uh, policy makers and uh, see if we can't stop some of that thinking here. <laughs> But I just wondered if you could tell us about the award you've, you've already received um, with your dates. In 2010, um, our, our family was very fortunate to win the International Khalifa Date Palm Award, which was hosted in Abu Dhabi. And uh, I guess to reflect the story, um, out of the blue came a phone call um, asking us to keep this particular time frame free. And then we were sent plane tickets and we were flown to... Abu Dhabi, um, my wife, and uh, also at that stage my oldest daughter, Jessie, accompanied us, and they put us up at the Royal Palace, uh, complete with our own butler, um, <laughs> for a week, and it's like, go your hardest at the restaurant, and uh, to, to sort of paint the image, and I don't know if anyone's had the good for fortune to stay at the Emirates um, Palace, and uh, you probably relay the story yourself if you can, but, you know, they've got a bar for cigars and a bar for caviar, and that's really top shelf stuff, you park your yacht out the front of the marina, and in you go. So uh, it, was, it was fantastic, you walk in the room and there's rose petals on the ground. But to, to cut a long story short, um, the date industry is very large and we're very small, but the, the new industry development award in which we won um, and, and awarded by our peers was in recognition to the plant material that we brought into Australia. The rest of the industry can see that there were hurdles, quite a few hurdles, particularly with um, the aqueous requirements getting plant material into the country. We're now recognised as having some of the best genetics in the world in Australia. So I think from 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 the I guess the results of doing that, we, we won this award, and, and, and that's that's um, been fantastic because apart from the, the Nuffield that opens doors, also the Khalifa International Date Palm Award has meant that we've gone to places and we've got in to see sheikhs and ambassadors, etc., to be able to talk about future promotion and expansion of the Australian date industry. That would have been more difficult without this award. So, yeah, look, I'm very humble about that, about that. and uh, we have a very big um, target to live up to to get anywhere near the expectations of, of both the Khalifa Award and the Nuffield Australia Award. Have you established you know, frequency or a watering schedule that you'll need in, in your soil types and also do you understand now what your total water use requirements will be into the future? Um, I'm, uh, I'm still largely reliant on others. There's others around that are better at putting that information together. My philosophy, we are changing and we are adding sophistication to our model but up till now when we're irrigating with you know, upwards of 5,500 EC units, it's been about survival, and I have not wanted to invest in technology like measuring the monitor, monitoring. I'd rather put my money towards importing um, in vitro plants, and that way I know I've got you know, distribution, cash flow that can come my way. But um, fortunately, we've been working in with um, the Northern Territory uh, Department of Ag and also the Victorian Sunraysia TAFE and these guys have got all the sophistication in terms of uh, moisture monitoring equipment so I'm actually going to be looking at um, extracting information or, or, or guiding people to them to, uh, to, to, to disseminate some of that information. Um, some of our own experiences regarding um, water and water usage, um, we're actually we're starting to work with wastewater producers now and uh, one of my um, favourite customers is uh, the large, large winery, Beer Oil Hardy, 
Like they're called Accolade Wines now, largest winery in the southern hemisphere. Um, we had a phone call one day several years ago saying we've got 300 megs of waste water. We're putting it out on our uh, woodlot with our eucalypt species. Unfortunately, they're not going so well. Uh, they're thinning out and uh, not taking up that wastewater. And that's a huge issue for them because they have to demonstrate to the EPA that there's efficient utilisation of that wastewater waste stream, otherwise it can close the front door down. So um, with that, we've moved eight palms in there and uh, we're, we're into that project now by about six years. And, uh, you know, fantastic results. And now when people come to us, you know, we're able to show that, yes, look, here's a winery using uh, wastewater on a floodplain environment, very, very high loads of potassium and boron and salinity. And look, I, I, I really, I'm probably raving here a little bit, but I am excited about the, the hardiness of the date palm, its ability to both withstand salinity, withstand prolonged periods of flooding, with um, ability to be able to stand um, periods of drought and, 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 and water uh, restrictions. I think I said salinity. Um, but also in the face of climate change and, and, and gaining heat and all these things. The date palm is actually one of those plants there where the hotter it gets and the harder the environment is, the happier we guys are. A lot of passion. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much, Dave, for that. And uh, another round of applause.